Please be patient. Please be patient. All systems downloading. Welcome to All right, welcoming in my friend, Dave Navarro, and of course, as always, Sam Roberts. And I think the most interesting parts about you, we're gonna dive into the music and the stuff that a lot of people know. Okay. But the coolest parts about, in some of your passion projects, mm -hmm. moving into filmmaking, we'll sure. also talk a little politics, but really the reason you're here is yeah. your new film, Morning Sun, which I've now watched twice. Have you? Yeah. Wow. I actually purchased it. I did the rent, and then I just straight up purchased it. I'm hoping that everyone chooses to do that. Yeah. Rent and purchase? Rent and then purchase. Because you get the double. Yeah, you, you get, get the, the double, double right? dip on it. <laughs> Not just so they could watch it again, but financially for you. It's better. Yeah, it works be out. Yeah. yeah. But how amazing. I mean, not to be insensitive, but at this time right now, I feel like such a trend is, you know, murder documentaries and thrillers. It and really is amazing. And the thing about what's going on right now is you have like Discovery, Investigation Discovery, you have uh, Making a Murderer, you had The Killing Field, which was just on Discovery, like these. Even the stair, Jinx is kind of in The that. Staircase, Jinx, these episodic, dramatic documentaries. And most of them focus on the killer. And what I chose to do was to not focus on the killer, but focus on my story and about my mom's story and make it more pointed at domestic violence. And not, because a lot of times what I see happen is the killers become these interesting, almost cult figures. Like Robert Durst is, people are fascinated by him, you know what I mean? But I guarantee you that the family members of the people he killed aren't that fascinated. Right. So I didn't want to do that with my film. But, does, that, does that drive you nuts? Because that's the one criticism like the OJ show has. Yeah. Like we're dramatizing this thing and it really is about like, I mean, I guess it's about the prosecution too, but it's about OJ and the oh, yeah. defense team and all this stuff. It really isn't about the victims at all. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, God, I mean, I admit that I, I watch all that stuff, too. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't know if I'm criticizing that as much as, because I, you know, I'm a human being that likes to be entertained just like anybody else, but I just didn't want to make that. You know, that's, especially when, when it's my story. And I think that, you know, there was something about this particular story which was so close to my heart that I wanted to delve into it and have a greater understanding about it. And to give a brief synopsis, yes. you know, in terms of the last seven years you were actually working on this film, at the age of 15, I think, again, a lot of people know you for music, mm -hmm. age of 15, your mom was murdered by her then ex, yep. which was something that you've had to deal with your entire life. And I think one of the craziest parts about the story is not only did that happen, but he was on the loose for yeah. seven years. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, here's an interesting thing, and maybe it goes back to what we were talking about, but instrumental part of catching this guy was John Walsh in America's Most Wanted, which is in that wheelhouse of right. being fascinated by this kind of behavior. And, and so that program put a lot of eyes on the murder and on the death. And, and Who decided on, to use that route, by the way? And the killer was caught as a result of the show. What do you mean? Like, who did you guys go? Was it... Your father that went to America's Most Wanted? Who was No, who they just decision? pick up this, this guy was on the uh, top 10 most wanted list. I mean, this was a, you know, a very highly wanted guy because it was a double murder, double homicide with special circumstances. Um, it was a death penalty case. And this guy was on the run, top 10 FBI most wanted. And you know, the show, believe it or not, and I'll tell you, the show contacted us because they wanted to do a feature and they wanted our input and they wanted mm -hmm. our voices and both my family and I felt it was sensationalistic, didn't want to have any part of it. This is our personal lives. How dare you try and make this entertainment? Totally. So we pushed it away, and wouldn't you know that that's what helped catch the killer. And I've since gone back and met with John Walsh and mm. thanked him personally for well, that. That's the interesting thing about America's Most Wanted is that it is sensationalistic and probably 95% of the people that watch that show are just doing it for the pure entertainment. For sure. But there is the 5% that no other show has and that even might if it, actually solve Even something. if it draws eyes in for entertainment yeah. and then it jogs your memory or yeah. alerts you to something that maybe you saw or you know about or whatever the reason is, that's a good thing, you know? Right. And, and I would also, when the show happened, I didn't know it, but I've come to learn that John Walsh is, you know, a surviving father of his murdered son. So, and that's why he started the, the show. And I didn't know that at the time, so. But it was, it was pretty incredible, like to have 
you know, that, that kind of uh, pressure put on the killer, you know, and to, to know that to, to a degree the FBI and, and the police department and, and much of the nation was behind getting this guy. I want to give a spoiler and quickly too as an aside, I think it's so important, I think you do a really good job, especially when you're speaking about the film and press, that it was a double murder and yeah. you know, obviously your mother was, this is a big deal, but also it was like your aunt, not by, by right. blood, but it's, it's very, thank you for putting a spotlight on the fact that it's two very important people. It is and you know, to a degree I had to highlight that, you know, I had to highlight that it was a double murder and that it was my aunt as well, but I also didn't want to focus on her story because that's another family's sure. story. Yeah. You know we what I mean? We were sensitive to it. And it's not my, yeah. you know, I, I don't, you know, look, I'm ready to deal with it on a public level. Maybe they're not. So, you know, let's let them, you like, know, respect their privacy. That's what I was going to ask you. Like, when did you get to the point where it's like this traumatic thing is something that, because once you put out a documentary and mm -hmm. you put it on America's Most Wanted, it's like, you're a very public guy, yeah. and now that becomes something that you're gonna do interviews, you're gonna see people in the street, and now everybody has permission to bring it's, it up to it, you. That's a strange question because, um, you know, I wasn't in the public eye when America's Most Wanted came out. I was uh -huh. 15, so in a strange way, this became a public issue well before I was, you know, right. working. Um, so I kind of just, it, it I don't know any other reality. Right. You know, I don't know it any other way. So um, it didn't, there was never a day where it felt too invasive. And uh, certainly, as you guys know, having control of the edit <laughs> changes. <laughs> you know, I know exactly what's in that movie. Right. You know what I mean? Because I made it. But I can imagine you got so obsessive with the details in the edit because you're such a perfectionist. Yeah. I, At some point, you just got to like... Well, it that's was seven what, years, that right? Was, yeah, I mean, well, because over the course of seven years, I work, you know, I work in a band, and I work on a television program, and so I had to be leaving town all the time for months at a time. So it took a long time to make the film because it was just me and my partner, Todd Newman. Who's it, your best friend? My best friend and directed the film, and uh, it was literally the two of us got in our car one day with video cameras and said, okay, let's make a movie. Yeah. And we didn't know how to make one. We didn't have an agent or a manager or a company or financers or any of that. Like, we literally just out of pocket like started doing it and making it. So I think that's one of the, one of the factors in why it took so long. Well, and not to get back to that spoiler, but I think one of the most interesting parts of the film is when you actually, and it's crazy to me that you went to the prison to revisit yeah. Years later, yeah, the guy that murdered 30, your mom. over thirty years. But it had bothered you for so long. Yeah, I don't know. Look, they talk about closure. You you say that it bothered me for so long as as though that's a surprise. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Believe, you never got over this. <laughs> yeah, sure you mean it does tend to have long term effects. And the humor <laughs> kicks in. Thank you. I mean, like something that's that terrible is you always going to be though. terrible. You said. Maybe this is an opportunity for me to put everything in its place, and something. There's a reason for me for doing this. I went to San Quentin to visit this guy, kind of as an exercise in personal empowerment, as walking through fear, um, and there was a vast area of unknowns that I thought there's going to be some kind of answer here. Not from him, because I, I know that he's not going to give me an answer that makes sense. Right. Um, it wasn't to scream at him and condemn and get into that, you know, lifetime movie moment. We weren't doing that, you know. This was just going into the prison, looking this guy in the eyes, and then leaving the prison with him in jail and me going back out to my life. And, that, and having that be empowering and also be an exercise at walking through fear. But the cameras were shut off at that point, too. Yeah. So we follow you all the way up into that car ride, and. Just being honest, you're looking pretty nervous at this point. Yeah. This it's is an a intense moment, intense obviously. Moment, yeah. And then but here's the beautiful thing. You see how nervous I was and how intense it was, but I went through it anyway. What else in my life is ever going to be that nerve-wracking? Right. Nothing. So, you know, now the next time I get nervous to step out in front of a festival audience with the band, I'll be like, I faced my mom's killer. What's the problem here? Right. <laughs> you know What's what I mean? What's the worst person that's in it's, that anyway, What's right going to happen? I mean, it just... Uh, it was, yeah, and the crazy thing, Katie, is that we went up there without, we didn't set it up. We didn't have like a victim's advocate group helping assist this. 
I didn't call ahead. He didn't know I was coming. The jail didn't know. We just Did he have to have you on a list or something? I don't know. We just arrived. We just went. Like, and I don't advise that <laughs> for most people. <laughs> like, now I know why there's victims' rights groups that help people get into situations like this. We just went and uh, it was it was I, I'm sorry crazy. to pull another line that you said, that, but it was so impactful during this whole sequence of events that was happening. But you go, I don't know why I'm not just lunging across and, mm-hmm. and ch- just choking this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, not exact words, but I don't understand how you as a person and knowing you as a person just don't have that moment where you just want to flip out on him. Because I think that the moment was for me and it was for me to take back some power. And I feel that losing my shit would be giving up my power. Do you know what I mean? And it's not so much like I had a choice and I opted to not, that just wasn't the reality. You know, that wasn't what transpired. And it wasn't my story. And I gotta tell you, I'm grateful that it wasn't because I would have left. You know, can you imagine like you lunge over at someone, visiting room in a prison, guards come and they're pulling you apart and it's a whole thing. Like, I would have left that prison traumatized and enraged and completely activated on a negative path. And I would have taken that experience with me as opposed to taking the experience that I did take, which was a really positive exercise. And I asked you, uh, as a friend offline, I was so curious as to what he said. I thought you had a really good point about this is also somebody that you saw 30 years later that's now very old. Yeah. And to Todd's point, your friend and director of the film, textbook sociopath, like he yeah. didn't even want to really go there. He no. didn't want to talk about it. No, no, no. No, I tried to. He moved away from it. We had a very brief exchange. I got to look him in the eye. That was it, you know? Wow. And I was cool. Like, I was, this is what I want to do. You know, I, don't, I, didn't wanna, I didn't really want to dig it up either because this guy is not in a position to accept or uh, be responsible for, you know, I mean, he, he's not gonna do that. And to go to him, go to, I mean, think about it. This is the one person in the world that has shown the least amount of trust to me or my family. So going to him for the answers mm. to connect the dots is totally erroneous. That's not gonna work, you know what I mean? You gonna look to him to fix this? I don't think so. This was about just kind of going and walking through it. And like, you know, it took a minute. And on the way home, it was like, I was spinning out. Um, but the one thing that did happen, and, I, and you know, I'll leave with this before we move on, if you want to, is that uh, as a trauma survivor, because this is trauma we're talking about, and as a trauma survivor, we tend to stuff away experiences and, and feelings and memories. And so what I had done was stuffed away this experience, this memory, tried to avoid thinking about it through drugs, through art, through whatever, whatever you have. And walking through this fear-based situation and making this film and putting it in a linear timeline mm. really allowed me the opportunity to not only face it and get through it and get on the other side of it, but now all the experiences that I'd locked away that were good came back. Because Ooh. you lock away stuff in the past to protect yourself. I mean, it's human nature. But along with that are the good memories, you know? And so to be able to get that back, I mean, there were, there were gifts and rewards through this process that I didn't foresee. And uh, I, 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 I couldn't be happier that we did this. Was it easier for you to do it with a camera on you? Like, as a performer, you know that when there's an audience there, even if it's a perceived audience, there's a responsibility to, whether it's get this done or be real or not mm-hmm. be real or whatever it is. Like, do you, do you think that the fact that- It's interesting. I, there's um, a camera at you, there's an audience that's kind of following you on this thing. You know? you know, when I watch it back, I wish I was a little bit more aware of the camera, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like, God, I could have used a little makeup in that scene. But, you know, it was really raw and I just kind of let go of it, you know, and I just ignored it. And, and the truth is that the cameraman was my best friend, Todd. So it really didn't feel all that uh, intrusive. Right. And it really didn't feel like I had to be on. Right. Um, it wasn't till, the one thing that did help about it was that there were certain days that we were gonna shoot scenes and, and, and things and uh, it locked me into having to commit to do them. Do you know right. what I mean? Exactly, yeah, that's the responsibility. Yeah, so the day we rented the car to go to San Quentin, 
and shoot that, like, you know, if there weren't cameras and all that stuff around, I might have pushed that back a week. Right. So I got it done. And I think that, yeah, I think making the picture really helped force me to do this. Right. Does it, do you want to stay in this realm of filmmaking in terms of docus? <laughs> never, <and> <laughs> never again, <laughs> really? never again. In fact, Todd and I are launching a, a film production company, Spread Entertainment. We, this is our first film. The funny thing is, we did this to learn how to make a movie. We were on the phone one night, we want to be filmmakers. How do you do it? I don't know. What do you make a movie about? I don't know. And I say, well, you know, they say to focus on the one thing you know best. And in my head is like, well, I know this situation best. Let's make a documentary about this. You sure. Skip, skip music. That so, well, I don't want to make a music documentary. I live it like it's I'm, too know, close to home. Yeah, it's just it wouldn't be. There was no room for discovery with that. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think telling a linear story or telling a documentary about this or even a scripted drama, there's discovery involved. And music, I've, I've just, like people have asked why I didn't score the movie. It just would be too much, too much me in it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So we got together, we made the film, came to learn that with documentary filmmaking, it can go on forever. Like, just forever. Like, you have to just one day go, you want to be done with this? Because <laughs> I got my life to get back to. You know uh -huh. what I mean? Because all it takes is somebody to say something interesting, and now you're chasing down archive footage to go with that, and that goes along into something else, and it just can never end. I mean, we had a seven-hour cut of this film in the timeline. And at that time, we felt it was all vital, you know? Of course you feel like it's all vital. It's like watching your own stuff, too. It's yeah, like hard I to mean, cut stuff. They talk about in edits, you know, you got to kill your children. Well, yeah, I, I think it's strange, too, because you were talking about Dave being a perfectionist, but, like, it seems like with this project, you got to be totally hands-on. Like, yeah. This is my thing, yes. blah, blah, blah. Yes. Whereas music and TV, that's as collaborative as collaborative, one can think of. Collaborative, yeah, for sure. But if you want to move more into film and, you know, starting a production house and everything, mm -hmm. you're moving into something again that's... Yes collaborative right and and I want that like this I've had the experience of two men in the camera making it no corporate structure at in place no financiers um, and it was a great experience and it took forever now I want to do scripted dramatic psychological thriller that world right. you know tell a story have shoot days have a timeline you know have a well, budget like have it be structured because Otherwise, I'll never finish. And is it is it is that part of it that you know while it's collaborative, this team of people I'm working with for a finite time mm -hmm. on a finite project, it's not where like you're in this band, and if once you make it, it's like no, this is the band. Yes. And we're, I'm working with these people even if we hate each other now. Would you know? And you hear yes. every band ever has. Yeah, that and every band I've been in has had that dynamic. Yeah. And you know, with the film, it went on forever. My band has been going for 30 years. Right. I do a TV show that you know. God, God willing, goes on forever, but it's been going on for a long time. I would love to have a project that's just like, start it here, finish mm -hmm. it here, maybe don't even write the story, just have someone else do it and oversee it. I would love to do that. So yeah. that's what we're focused on doing. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, you were, do you like, do you miss music once you get away from it at all? Or is it like you've been doing it, like you said, for 30 years, so it doesn't? No, I mean, I really, it's always gonna be I feel there. fortunate because I get to do both. I get yeah. to do the TV show, and then we stop down, then I go on tour with the band. Right. So it's, it's exhausting, to say the least, but I, I, I get to have both. And, and the beauty of my, my instrument is I can play it anywhere. Right, you know? well, And play with different. You play have with your other people, band, yeah. Too, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. really interesting, actually. Yeah, Royal Machines. Play at corporate events and. We do a residency in LA at the Roxy every year, you know, and it's just it's a travel, it's a revolving band of different musicians, and yeah, it's just people who like to play music for the sake of it. How amazing is it though what's happened with Jane's Addiction? Because Jane's Addiction was kind of this sort of counterculture kind of drug band mm -hmm. at the time that it came out, yeah. and now it's kind of evolved into this thing where it's pretty appropriate for a lot of places that it wasn't necessarily appropriate yeah, for. Yeah. The I'm, RNC and the DNC? <laughs> well, no, Jane's is not doing that. Oh, really? No, no, no. <laughs> no, the <laughs> RNC can't afford <laughs> Jane's. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but, uh, you know, it's just, I've never known it. I mean, I've been in that band since I was 17 years old. Yeah. 
Like, that's all I know, you know? So it, we did, I certainly didn't expect it to become well-known, certainly back in the day, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? We were just a couple of junkies yeah. and just playing in our garage and making music because we loved it and it caught on, you know, for whatever reason. And All of a sudden somebody hears it and you're like, I don't understand, why is this leaving the garage? Like, what, everybody yeah, wants well, to there's hear that, it. I mean, like, there's, that, there was that, there's still that, that artistic self-doubt component totally. yeah. that you're just like, wait a minute, you know, like, you know, who am I fooling here? Right. And you're sitting there being like, oh, I hope they didn't listen to the whole album because they probably <laughs> yeah. like that song, but they don't I like hope, the rest I hope we of get it. to sign the contract before they listen to everything. <laughs> totally. Totally. I have to talk about Ink Master, too, because sure. to me it's amazing that you can go into series now or like one and two seasons and you've mm -hmm. done well. Yeah. Seven seasons now coming yeah. up in the next month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredible. And then also the new kind of a part that you have, Ink Master Redemption. Redemption. Yeah. Yeah. Very neat. It's crazy. Um, yeah, super grateful. I think that I, I work with a really great team of people, Oliver Peck and Chris Nunez, and it's a tattoo show, and there's been a lot of tattoo shows. What we are is a competition, so you get a handful of tattoo artists. Every week somebody's eliminated, Project Runway style, kind of. Mm -hmm. The winner gets $100,000. I mean, there's, you know, the price, which is, you know, after taxes, it's okay. It's not great. But what they get, what we found to be most valuable, is this is a three-month infomercial right. for these totally. artists. So they, they're real artists. It's not like it's some guy with a tattoo needle. It's actual guys with shops who are like right. Yeah. So what happens is their show, you know, the show airs, and if they stay on long enough, we found that these artists, even the ones that don't win, end up being booked for a year and a half, two years because people fall in love with their work, but also fall in love with them as people. And it's very unusual to be able to have that much of uh, information about an artist that you might go see. I think the best part is too, you throw yourself in the mix sometimes. You've actually gotten tattoos from the guys in some of the challenges. Yeah, yeah, How many? Yeah. Uh, I think I've been tattooed three times by, by our These are artists. things people think about for like their entire life and you're like, yeah man, it's a challenge. Well, Just put point, it on there. I don't, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> Your back, though, is insane. Yeah, our guest, our, our judge, Oliver Peck, did my back. It's Amazing. a work of art. Yeah, 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 he's great. You guys had a deal with Mary Jean on that show, right? Wasn't she a contestant? She's the porn star that gave the uh, artist a hell of a time. Yeah, how do you and, know about that? Yeah, well, you guys Mary are both Jean, friends with a lot of porn stars. Yeah, Mary Jean's a friend of mine, and she does oh my, my show all the time. Oh, my God, And she's really? out of her mind. <laughs> but I had her on immediately after I watched the show, and I was like, Mary, you got to come back on Did she show. come on? <laughs> She after came it, and saw you after that show aired? After it aired, yeah. Oh my God, I've seen her since. Yes. <laughs> Do you know that? I don't know that you've seen her For since. For something that is yet to air. Really? Oh yeah. What is it? Well, Come on, spill it. I'm not telling you. Is it, she's a gold mine. she's incredible. Oh God, I wanted to produce a show around her. Yeah. There's yeah. your she next, uh, there's Spread Entertainment's else. first uh, series. If I did a show about Mary Jean, I, I would be able to finance any art movie I ever wanted to make for the rest of my life. I, I turned her into my person on the street correspondent for the show. Did you really? Yeah, so she just goes to events oh, for me. Oh, that's your correspondent? Yeah, Mary Jean, yeah. yeah. You talk about her all the time. She's amazing, yeah. she's amazing. She has, she's got ass implants. Yeah. Like you can set There's a can of beer. Thing. Oh. You can set a can of beer on these things. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Honestly, it's the most outrageous thing. Why would you want that? You would have to ask her. I don't know, maybe it, she... It's very, I mean, it's very of the time right now. It is, I, mean? I suppose. It, it is. Mm. It's like the new breast implant, like Wait, now... To briefly tell the, in, in a few sentences when you sent her out on Correspondent when she just kept talking about sex. We, that's all she talks it's about, because that's it all she knows. It wasn't relevant at yeah. all. And like, she just brings it, like, everything she seems seems like vaginal to her. Like, she yeah, thinks yeah, that's yeah. a vagina, and this is a penis, and this is, yeah, like, she's just talking about threesomes Very all the time. Appropriate. It's amazing. Yeah, no, she's the best. And she'll do, like, she can't get through an interview, like, halfway through the interview. Anytime she's in studio, she's like, should I take my shirt off? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think you should. Let's get comfortable. <laughs> and so she just takes her shirt off, and yeah. it's just, and then continues on. She, with whatever yeah, she was, she talking was about. crazy, man. No idea why I wasn't on that show. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. A segue from that to, I want to talk politics real quick, because I think okay. that's a really cool part about you, is how, how engaged you are and how savvy you are. And I think I, fa I found you board. two on Red Eye. Yes. Right. That's well, where so, I, so are you, like, are you, because you're a Fox News fan. Yeah. Are you a conservative guy? I'm a cable news fan, and, and, my, <laughs> and my views are pretty spread out. Right. Socially, I'm as liberal as they come. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? When it comes to uh, military, finance, the jury's still out. You right. know, we have a lot of really interesting people. We have two super out there 
front runners or you know a front runner and actually a new poll came out today I think Cru- Trump is now in second I place I saw that yeah the Ted Cruz is in first but not Ted Cruz but not in the not in the uh, South Carolina poll no nationally Trump is still, but nationally yeah Ted Cruz is number one yeah we'll see how long that lasts well I don't terrifying. know I mean it's like the louder that Trump gets about Ted Cruz the better Ted Cruz does yeah that's right what he, that's what he goes back to making fun of Jeb Bush again yeah I, it's like, well which is the weirdest thing guy. because you saw that we saw this the, the debate the most recent debate where Trump laid into Jeb Bush George W. Bush for like what felt like 45 minutes yeah and Jeb's in the last place like what was this what do you think the strategy was there I think he's just like okay because you're right people start to turn on him when he starts hitting Ted Cruz Ted Cruz has these supporters but Jeb Bush does not have supporters so it's like when Trump and he spent the most money of anybody (laughs) right and he's bringing George out of George looks broken and it's sad. just a tragedy. The whole thing is just—it's it's, really terrible. It's, it's Shakespearean. And it really is. I mean, I've been—it's my favorite story. At first, like just Trump running yeah. was my favorite story of the election. Just mm-hmm. watching what he does, but now, like, I can't get enough of Jeb Bush, and like every step he takes, I know, is a misstep. Did you see when he was campaigning? Because everybody saw the please clap clip, obviously. Mm-hmm. The which? The please clap clip. Oh yeah. When he was asking, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he did this—he did this uh, thing in New Hampshire the day that, of the primaries. And he goes up in front of this luncheon of dudes, and it's like com- already compared to like Donald Trump talking, talking to arenas, it's embarrassing. But he goes up in front of them, and like what felt like mid speech, he looks over and he goes, oh, Is that it? And the guy, who, just the guy who, by the way, comes up to hear on him, yeah, yeah, so yeah. what's even worse, walks up to him, and he goes, Yeah, and, and Jeb Bush just looks at the audience and he goes, Well, well I guess we're done. They're, uh, they're rapping me, so. Uh, so bad. And he wow. just kind of wanders off stage. And the doesn't guy necessarily have a commanding presence, no. does he? The guy goes, <laughs> the guy goes, well, I think you have a very tight schedule today. And the camera follows Jeb Bush, and he sits down at a table and just starts to eat. And it's just like, you didn't have anything to do, dude. Oh, man. It's so... It's really sad. It's upsetting on a human level. The best part, I will say the best part of him bringing George W. out on the campaign trail is I didn't know this, but he's a painter. Oh, yeah. I didn't know. I knew. I didn't you know. Knew? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he paints George like, w, yeah, he paints now. Weird paintings of, like, dogs. <laughs> it's like, I got to show you this I'm stuff. I'm sorry, what? I spent, like, a half hour Googling his artwork. In fact, <laughs> I'm dying to get a piece. Yes. Okay, I have please. to. Thank you for bringing that up. Can I get, can I get another one of your personal hobbies in there? Whatever you want. Really Whatever you want. So what's amazing about Dave, and he's one of the most interesting people genuinely that I've ever met. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. But you spend, like, I mean... The story you had, not to get back to the docu, but it, there's a segue here. Your interest in art, mm-hmm. you have so many pieces from so many people that I would never have expected. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Who? Serial killers. John Wayne Gacy? Oh, yeah, I got a couple of Gacy's. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. Wait, I gotta keep be honest. Down the line, though. Of, the, of just the killers or my art collection? No, you have a beautiful art collection. You have, I mean, you have Warhols, you have. Yeah, it's, I have classic have, art, which this have? this reminds me of Lichtenstein. That's why I liked oh, it so I knew much. Oh, maybe it was subconscious. Yeah, that's why I liked it. Some um, of those. Um, yeah, but I mean, I have you know Albert Fish, who's yeah. you know I have a courtroom <laughs> document signed by him. Wow, I've got Albert Fish is among the, it, I, he's, he's the worst. He's the he's the one worst of the worst. Of There's a letter that he wrote. What he did is he ate this little girl and then wrote. I'm sorry, what? He ate a little girl. Yes. I think it took him nine days to eat her whole body. And then he wrote a detailed letter about it and sent it to her parents, explaining how he ate their daughter. There are books about him, like, what? like ever a book about him where he's like sitting on the train. And this is a true story. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It's like from the 1920s. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, it's great stuff. He's like, the girl's wrapped up, and he's like, literally at a point of orgasm, just holding this stuff, knowing that he's gonna eat. These are her parts. Knowing Damn, that he's going to get to eat this. This is not cool, man. No, I'm why not would you, Why advocating. would you want the letter for that? See, it's that's what blows my mind. That's the weird thing. And when you get back to what we were talking about, how is it an oxymoron? That's a, to me, subjectively, that's like supporting crazy people. Or being interested in it. Or being fascinated by it. It is a weird thing when you start to explore, like, how can a brain work like this? Like, how is this a person... For instance, the, no, John Wayne Ga- the John Wayne Gacy paintings, and I'll tell you how this happened. The John Wayne Gacy paintings, much like those electric chair Warhol paintings I showed you, where they're in pop colors, like electric chair, murder, you know, it's a capital punishment symbol in yellow. It's juxtaposed in a weird, bright, happy way, which makes it interesting. John Wayne Gacy painted himself as a clown. He painted the seven dwarves. 
Um, Henry Lee Lucas painted little, drew little cartoon dogs. Uh, Richard Ramirez drew Bambi, which I have one of those. So it's this weird. Does that make it? Does that make it no, more it acceptable? No, it makes it more interesting because what I'm talking, what we're dealing about, is the most horrific monster of a mind that is almost reverted to a childhood, mm. yeah. traumatized little infant mm. that's painting and drawing all these little happy, expressive things. Like it, to me, a, a John Wayne Gacy clown painting is much more terrifying and interesting than if he did some murder, dark skull stuff, which he's done. But, you know, and I think that there's an element of having come from such a dark childhood that to have an interest in the darkness makes it less, I feel less vulnerable to it. May I ask something really tacky? You? In taste. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really curious uh -huh. how much did that sold for? Which? The clown. The pogo? Yeah, I don't know. What would know. you guess, Sam? I mean, for John Wayne Gacy. You're usually good at this. Because I mean, that's like the iconic thing. Cause it's he the iconic up thing, but he also crime. cranked him out in prison. You know what I mean? Like he didn't just One of how it. many? Uh, who knows? Well, you know what, I mean? what did it sell for? Like, what did I pay yeah. for it? I don't recall, because I got it back in the 90s. Then, oh, actually, the Pogo was a gift from Marilyn Manson, who got it from Anton LaVey. So it's like triple. Perfect. Yeah, it's like <laughs> Anton LaVey gave it to Manson, who gave it to me. So it's like. You know, There's a history with it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Triple entendre. But that's so too, to like, I mean, those paintings are like listening to, like, Ch Charles Manson's music recordings. They, oh, they're, they're with, like the so Wilson brothers. Oh, and so great. And you start to realize, like, this monster who has, like, been up here, it's like, no, he's really bad at music. Yeah. And that probably, like, he, all, this is what he wanted to do, and he couldn't do it. So yeah, this is a, what he did instead. I have a Charles Manson drawing, and it literally looks like a five year old. You have a Manson did. drawing, too? Yeah. All he wanted to do was be an artist, but he's not an artist. Yeah, yeah. What and did he draw? It just, it's like a weird, I'll show you. It's like a weird little scribbled, colored in. It just, he had to explain to me who Charles Manson was. You didn't know. He didn't know. That was a rough one. Are you sure you want to say that on camera? <laughs> yeah. Well, I knew what he did on a surface level. I didn't know the details. I didn't know he ate a child. Well, that's no, Albert that's Fish. Right, that's I'm not, just saying. You sound very ignorant, Katie. I'm, I'm smart in the categories that are applicable to me as an individual. There's a restaurant here in Los Angeles called El Coyote, which is the restaurant where Sharon Tate had her last meal. They were all at that restaurant, then went to the Cielo House in Beverly Hills, and that's when the Manson family got him. I had to show her pictures, and she was not stoked about it. No. Yeah, I had my parents, first time I came to LA, because my parents used to live here, and they didn't like that I was interested in it, because they lived here when the Manson stuff was happening. They were talking about how terrifying yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. But I made them take me to the neighborhood where Sharon Tate's house was and all that. You just, it's, there's something sort of so it's over here about it. Yeah. You have it, to it, it's, But you didn't explore. close the loop though on that though, in the sense that I, I'm curious as to how your mind works full circle and having that interest in, in these I did close the loop. What I said was that I said by being close to that kind of darkness, there is a familiarity. There is a lack of vulnerability. It's as interesting to me as you are with Dateline 48 Hours because you're glued to that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's the same to me. I've just taken it a, a like notch you're, above. Now you're touching it. Yeah. Now this thing that you're just watching, like this is actually, this is the thing. Yes, this it's is real it. now. This is the thing. Much like, you know, as, as an art collector, and I collect a bunch of, you know, a lot of different artists, there's sometimes I like a piece because I just like what it looks like. Sometimes there's a piece because there is a cultural history attached to that piece. And to have it is, uh, you know, part of, I guess, the fascination with collecting it. Um, it's like finding, like, like, stuff from, like, the turn of the century from America that is, like, so racist. Yeah, like Nazi like, propaganda, or, or Nazi the, yeah. paraphernalia is massive. And there's a huge underground market for all that stuff. Ooh. You know, why is it interesting? I don't know, but. Uh, Speaking of bizarre and yeah. like getting to, like Michael Jackson to me, yeah. fits right in that sort of category of things. Like I would put, when, before we were talking about serial codes, mm -hmm. we were talking about George W. Bush's paintings. Yes. I thought like my fantasy one day would be to have a, a Bush and a Gacy just like hanging next to each other. Yeah. Because culturally it's like, it's not about, yeah. yeah. Michael Jackson to me fits into that category. Mm -hmm. So. 
you actually got to meet the guy. You yeah. played with him. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was it like to interact with him on an artistic I level? I gotta tell you, man, he was, without a doubt, the kindest, most professional, incredible talent that I've ever, I've ever been in the presence of. Mm. Like, without a doubt. We had a rehearsal time, let's say it was nine o'clock. He was there at nine o'clock. He rehearsed as hard as he performed. And this is like 2002 or six. Yeah, it was at the Democratic National Convention. But Michael is as, I mean, Michael can do whatever he wants at this point in his life. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And we were, we were performing for Bill Clinton and <laughs> it was, who was front and center. So it's like, I'm playing <laughs> and there's Bill Clinton there with that weird smile that he has where it's like he's, he's aware that someone might get a shot of him so he better have a smile on. You know what I mean? Like, yes, And I'm yes. thinking, I'm analyzing it as we go, like, is he really <laughs> smiling? Or is he aware that there's cameras here? But so I'm looking down, there's Bill Clinton, and then here's Michael, and it's just him and me on stage. Just him and me. And it was a, the craziest, most surreal moment, but he was, you know, I didn't spend a lot of time with him. But like, he wasn't like, because you were playing black, black and white, right? Yeah, yeah. He wasn't like, mm -hmm. Ain't retentive about like you stand here. This is how you play. No, 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 no. He wanted me to do whatever was me. Wow. He was when like Michael tells Ooh. you to just do your thing. Yeah. Well, like, he was just like, I'm gonna be here. I'm gonna be here at this part of the song. I'm gonna be here, and let's run it. And we ran it, and he was just where he said he was gonna be. And then he was all humble at the end of it. You know, thank you so much oh for gosh. like thanking me. And I'm like sitting here going, wow. You know, I'd never met a kinder more professional guy in my life. But to go from the kid in, in the garage who's like, I don't think anybody really likes this music, yeah. to know that you're good enough, that you're playing one of Michael's well, you know, most iconic songs next to Michael, and you have the ability to play and kind of analyze Bill Clinton's facial expression. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so weird, that plastic it is. smile. But, that... but here's the difference. As an artist, yeah. it's not that I knew I was good enough to do that. Mm -hmm. It was wondering how I managed to pull the wool over everybody's eyes. You're still up there on stage going, yeah. like, wait until they pull me off this stage, because yeah, I'm yeah. not supposed to be how, here. How, how are they fall? They're falling for it. I don't understand. Because <laughs> yeah. you know, like, it's, really it's never talent, it's all a trick. Yeah, it's yeah. a trick. Yeah. And then it made me respect them less. <laughs> right, right. Like, he's like, falling for this? Maybe like, he's not that great after all. No, really it was funny. amazing. Maybe he's not the king of pop if <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> king of a slop, more like. <laughs> you know, he was great. I mean, that was, that was one of the highlights for me. Working with Michael and working with Lou Reed, two of uh, my all-time heroes and two vastly different people. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I feel like we're time burglarizing you. That was amazing. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. And so Ink Master, obviously, starting next month. Yeah. More importantly, On Demand, Morning Sun, documentary. Yeah, iTunes, On Demand, Amazon, wherever. I think I got it, I got it on iTunes. I, I think I we established buy. rent and then buy. Yeah. 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 So actually, you just made double money off of me. That's right. <laughs> That's I recommend yeah. that. I've always hated that. I, I, the rent thing always seems like such a scam to me. Like, I never rent anything. You don't. And then I end up paying, like, three times as much and just watching it once because I'm like, no, I don't want it to expire. For three ninety nine or one ninety nine or whatever it is, I'm not paying money to not be able to watch it in three days. Like if I want it forever, well, don't you only have thirty days to watch it? Yeah, like I don't want it to be gone. Like I want. Have it in you my had condition. it happen? Have you stopped a movie, and then you only have twenty four hours to finish it? I, I don't think I've ever rented on. A, I've got an iTunes collection full of stuff that I've watched once. Yeah, because I'll just buy it instead. I just want it to be there forever and just. I want to watch it twice. I can watch it twice. It's like five dollars though. At I'd, rather, I'd rather pay what, 15 for, rent? for the... But for I mean, the, like, that, at the end of the day, you're playing with, like, a few dollars. I don't understand you people with that. It's, it's, it's being in a position where I'm not being taken advantage of. Well, but, the craziest thing is that they don't allow you to rent at first. Yeah. They put it up, and it's $15 by now. You can rent three weeks from now. <laughs> yeah. And then they put oh, the really? rental up. Yeah, so they get me, you know... I, I'm a sucker, so I do it all the time anyway, but... I have, I've rented the same film three times. Can't do it. Because I've rented it, fell asleep. Next day, the 24 hours has elapsed, so I'm like, fuck, I gotta rent it again. Same thing, three times. Dave, you didn't log out of my Hulu account for like a month. I know, thank God. <laughs> With the F, man. There was, there this was no- This is my point I'm making here. But I mean, there was no elapsed time. There was, you know what right. I mean, I was like, I could watch that for as long as I want. That goes back to my childhood. We used to go into Blockbuster as a family and any of us that even thought about saying, I want to rent this movie, mm -hmm. my dad would scream at us if he knew we had seen it before. 
we, oh, really? we could not rent movies we had seen before because my dad's not paying a blockbuster fee <laughs> for a movie we've hard to see. That's my point. Well, well the crazy job. thing is blockbuster was not in the video rental business, they were in the video sale business because they made the bulk of their money on people who didn't Oh, return. really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. And then they charge like $60. Yeah, it's take. insane. Yeah. Amount. And you find that you spent $60, $70 on Uncle Buck. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, great movie, but... but you know what I mean? Know, like, you're just like, what yeah. did I just do? <laughs> it wasn't Citizen Uncle Kane. Buck. You don't know, put it that way. Right. <laughs> and a great place to end there. Dave, thank you so much. Thanks, Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks nice man. See you. Sam, as always. And, of course, you can stay tuned for more here at katie.show.